good morning. Welcome to Revival Now. Our goal is to pray for true revival in our culture, in our world, to uh, teach the Word of God so that we not only pray for revival, but we obey for revival. We're, you know, we're, revival, when I talk about that, what am I talking about? Am I talking about just a bunch of excitement over a, a pet doctrine or a uh, getting our churches to be bigger than they used to be, uh, getting people all fired up about a particular aspect of Christianity. Or what, what does revival really mean? It means to breathe new life. And uh, we're in a day when we just need to experience new life. We need the life of Jesus in a profound way in our culture, in our churches. You know, it's interesting that... We've always needed new life, but it's just in this last year we've, we've become able to see it more. It's not that these problems have just happened. It's just that this year we're, God's giving us the grace to see our need. He's given us the grace to see our need that's always been there. There's always been issues of complacency and prayerlessness and materialism and racial division and political division and all that's always been there. It's like God being the master surgeon, bringing that play, those things to, to bear in order to show us our need. And I love that because what that tells us is that God is not done with us, that God still has a purpose for us. And you know, if, if God ever stops showing you things, if God ever stops working in your life, then, uh, then, he, then it's not because he doesn't care anymore. It's because maybe your heart's gotten too hard where you're not listening. But I believe that, that many of us are listening to God today. I believe that you are. I believe that I am. And we're seeking his face. And I believe that, that God is at work in a powerful way. And things are kind of tough right now. Things are hard. Things are, there's a lot of uncertainty around us. But God has promised that he is going to restore the years the locusts have eaten. He's, he is, that is a promise I believe he's going to do. He's going to renew those things that have been neglected. He's going to restore those places in our lives that have, have uh, atrophied, have gotten sick, um, have become uh, complacent and broken, have decayed. And God's going to breathe new life. He's already doing that in so many different ways. And so as we continue to pray, that's what we're saying. We say revival. God transform us. God breathe new life into us. God give us uh, a renewal and, and move away those things that have kept us from knowing you and serving you. And I, and I just believe that that's what God's doing, and, I, and I, that's what we pray for. So let's do that. Let's spend some time in prayer this morning, and then let's get into the Word. Father in heaven, we, we just thank you for your love and goodness. Lord, we thank you for your presence here right now. We thank you, Lord God, that in the midst of all the turmoil and all the uncertainty, um, all the uh, dysfunction, all the shifting, oh God, Thank you that in the midst of all of that, you are God and you never stop being God and you never stop being interested. You never stop ruling and reigning over us and you never give up. So Father, you God, you can already see the end. You already see the end result and you're calling us to a greater thing. You're calling us, Lord, to a better days. And so Father, we pray that you would lead us according to your will and of your kingdom. We pray, Lord God, that we would not accept a false peace that the world wants to give, but that we would seek after the peace of the Lord Jesus, the only peace that only you can give. And that peace comes when we repent of our sins and we put our faith in you and we live in obedient faith to you and to your commands and we live for your kingdom. Lord, it's your kingdom we want. It's not the kingdom of this world that we want. It's not the affirmation of the culture that we want. Lord, it's your kingdom. It is your affirmation. It is your will and pleasure that we seek with all of our heart, God. And so, Father, I just pray you'd help us to be committed to that and to walk with you, to do the things that you have done and to say the things that you have said and to live by your teachings, by your principles, by your values. Lord God, we just love you and we give you praise. We pray for our government leaders. God, that you protect them and guide them and lead them. <clears throat> Lord, regardless of their political affiliation, that you protect every one of them. 
And that, God, that you'd give them a heavenly wisdom, heavenly guidance and direction, and that you would lead them, Lord, in, into a, in the types of uh, policies and, and directives that will lead for your kingdom, Lord, not the kingdom of this world, that, that will lead closer to you. Now, Father, we, uh, we know that you alone rule over the earth. You alone are the true master and the true king. And so, Lord God, we pray for your rulership over all nations. We pray, God, for your church, that we would awaken unto the love and holiness and righteousness that you've called us to, that we would be the people you've called us and redeemed us to be. Lord, we thank you so much for your death on the cross, for the blood that you shed that covers our sin. We are justified, redeemed, sanctified, ransomed by your blood. And Lord Jesus, we are made free in your resurrection. You have risen from the dead. And through your resurrection, Lord, we have eternal life. So Lord, we stand with you. We pray, Lord, that you give us a heart for you and a, a heart for your people and a way to love and serve the way you called us to. Lord, we pray for every family represented here today, every family that's struggling and hurting. We pray, God, for provision for those that are broken, for those uh, marriages that are strained by the, the trials that are happening. God, that you'd bring strength and power and healing in those marriages. We pray, Lord God, for children and for teenagers and for, for young people, Lord God, that are disillusioned and hurt and disoriented. Many have, have faced disappointing times this year and and are just feeling frustrated, God, that you'd give them extra power, extra grace and courage and strength. Lord, we pray for our pastors and our missionaries, our Bible teachers and our, our spiritual leaders, that you would guide them more and more toward your heart, Lord, and toward your will and your purpose. You'd anoint them with the Holy Spirit. Father, we can do nothing without you. I pray for every believer listening to me now, God, that you would pour out the Holy Spirit on us in a fresh way. Every every believer, that we would walk closed in the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would live in your strength and in your love and your wisdom. And Lord God, that you, we, would, we would reflect your glory to the world. And Lord, that we would care for our neighbors and that we would help those that are broken and hurting, those that are without food, those that are without shelter today. Lord God, that as we come across anyone in need, that today we would show your love in a profound way. Now, God, we, we thank you. We ask that you'd help us right now as we look into your word, as your word looks into us. Father, change us. Make us your people. Make us holy. Make us full of you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Again, thank you this morning for joining. I, I, just, I trust that, uh, that you're walking in God's blessing and his favor today. And that even if you're having a really tough time, a really tough day, that you know he's with you and he's standing with you and he's got you in his hands. Today, I want to talk about God's greater grace. You know, we're, we're people of the grace of God. The Bible says in Romans 5 that we are standing in it, that we stand in the grace of God. And that's a, that's a big thing. But sometimes... We lose sight of that. Sometimes we can get so caught up in the problems around us or the weaknesses within us or the uh, differences between us that we lose sight of the grace of God because, see, the grace of God is always bigger and greater than our weaknesses. The grace of God is always greater than the problems around us. And believe it or not, the grace of God is always greater than the divisions between us. And I really believe that those are some serious things that, that God would bring to bear today in our, in our teaching. We're looking at three passages of Scripture today as the Lord leads Psalm 27, and then Isaiah chapter 4, and then Acts chapter 11. We're going to try our best. Yesterday I didn't quite make it. But we're going to look at each of those because I think each of them has something particular to say about God's greater grace. I want you to know, let me say this again, that God's grace is bigger than the weaknesses within you. God's grace is bigger than the problems around you. And God's grace is greater than the divisions between you. 
And, and as we tap into his grace, as we listen to his word, and as we trust in his mighty power and we line our hearts up with him, we will experience okay. that grace in so many different ways. I want you to walk in the grace of God today. I want you to really know that God's grace is not just his uh, unmerited favor, his love for you that's beyond all those things. His grace is also his power, the, 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 the God's generous gift of power to live a holy life, to live a victorious life, to live a, a righteous life and a faithful life, obedient life, a life of love and compassion, a life of faith. But it's also God's grace, his, his safety net. When we fall short, when we mess up, when we don't quite get it, his grace is there. His grace is greater than all those things. I love that old hymn, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. And I love that, but it's greater than everything. And so we walk in it today. I want you to live in it today and experience it. Look at Psalm 27. Um, it's a beautiful prayer about basically it's the prayer is, look, God's my light and my salvation. Who am I going to be afraid of? What can man do to me when I'm walking in God, right? And at the end, of the, let me just read the whole thing. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I've asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer to me. You said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. Hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you who have been my help, cast me not off, forsake me not. O God of my salvation, for my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. They breathe out violence. Now, let me stop because this last part of the prayer I want to focus on. But what we've read so far is that I don't have to be afraid of anybody. I don't have to defend myself against anybody. And, and people are going to be people every time. Have you ever noticed that? That no matter what you do or say, people are always going to be people. Sometimes they're going to be really, really good. Sometimes they're really, really not so good. And they're going to, sometimes they're going to misunderstand. They're going to attack you. They're going to come after you. And, and sometimes that's just really painful and difficult. But, and, and so the psalmist is saying, look, God, you got to help me here. I'm trusting in you, and when they come after me, I need you to help me, but I need you to teach me your ways, right? I need you to get me focused on you and show me how to seek your face in the middle of all that stuff, right? Then at the end, I love what he says at the end, verses 13 and 14. He says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. So the beginning is, is this prayer that we need to pray. The, the psalmist ends with this. He says, look, I'm, I believe that one of these days I'm going to see God. I'm going to see God's goodness in the land of the living. Now, now ultimately that's heaven. We, we, we believe that ultimately, yes, one day we will go to heaven and we will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. But I believe that there's more to this verse. Scripture has layers of meaning. Never just think that it only means one thing. Scripture has deep, deep, deep. It's so deep, right? Well, the first thing is ultimately we know. When we get to heaven one day, you're going you're gonna to cross over into eternal life. You're going to see the goodness of God in all of its magnificence. You're going to see all the, all the things that God was doing behind your back that you didn't even know he was doing on your behalf. You're going to see it unfold before you. Now, however, 
I believe that there are times in our life when God shows us his goodness right here, right now. And what I need to do is, is I need to ask, say, God, give me a vision for your goodness in my future. You know, I, I don't believe that we're going to have a problem-free life. I don't know the future. I don't know what's going to happen. But, you know, I, I hear Christians today uh, talking as if it's all gloom and doom. I mean, that's all I hear is that, you know, everybody's the Antichrist, right? Everybody is out to get me. Everybody's got a conspiracy. Everybody's trying to take over the world. Everybody's trying to ruin everything. And you know what? It's just terrible. And we've got this vision of, of evil that we're living. And many people are praying evil on themselves. And it's like, well, stop for a minute. Get a vision for the ultimate goodness of God. Listen, God's goodness is going to win out. I don't know what's going to happen in the next month. I don't know what's going to happen in the next year. I don't know any of those things. I don't know which conspiracies are, are hogwash and which are real. I don't know any of that stuff. But I know this, my God is greater than the weaknesses within me and the problems around me. And so here's what I need to pray. Lord, give me a vision of your goodness. Lord, help me get my eyes not on the immediate problems around me, but on your vision for me. God has a great vision for you, for this country, for the nations of the earth. God has a great vision for his church. And there may be stormy times. There may be things that happen that are totally bizarre to us. I don't know. But I know this, when the smoke clears, Jesus will be Lord. He will be on the throne. And the world will be as he wants it to be. God is, is over all things. And God's grace is greater than the things that are happening around us. So the first thing is get a vision. Listen, get a vision for the kingdom of God, the goodness of God, because it's going to overcome the darkness. The Bible says that the darkness is fading away and the true light is already shining. That, that this is, a, this is a, a time to anticipate God's best, even if it comes through storm. Even if it comes through difficulty and, and hardship, God wins. And this psalmist is, is, is surrounded by people that are attacking him. And he's saying, but I know I'm going to see the goodness of God. When it's all over, I'm going to see the goodness of God. Listen, make that your prayer today. God, give me a vision of your goodness that whatever happens to me today, whatever I go through today, when the smoke clears, God, you're going to bring me to a better place. You're going to bring me to a better place. That gives us courage to do what verse 14 says. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. This is a day of courage. This is a day when we need to, to stand in God and literally wait on God. I was telling a, a young man yesterday, so look, when the Bible says wait on the Lord, it's not just being religious. It's not just saying a nice cliche, oh, wait on the Lord. It, no, it's giving you a strategy. There are times when you really need to sit and stop and wait in the presence of God and get God's vision for what he's doing in your life or get a word from God, a word of assurance, a word of direction, maybe even a word of correction. But you need to wait on God literally. I mean literally stop what you're doing and wait in his presence. You just, you just sit there and you just say, God, I'm, I'm going to sit here with you and I need to hear from you. Have your Bible open. Spend some time just listening, talking to God about what's going on. And God, give me a word. Give me a word. Give me something. If you need to correct me, God, correct me. If you need to redirect me, Lord, redirect me. But I'm going to wait on you. And that's where courage comes from. There is no greater courage than a person who has God's word spoken to them. God's given his assurance to them that he's got this. God's got this. Whatever Whatever things you're hearing out there in the world, listen, understand this. God's in control. He is Lord of all. His grace is greater than the things happening around you. Now, after we pray the prayer, you know, I've, I've been telling you the last several days that a, that a good way to deal with stuff is, first of all, is that we get a prayer, we pray, and we ask God for a word. And I'm serious about that. You don't have to be a, a prophet or an evangelist. or me. Listen, if you're a believer, you've got the spirit, you've got the word. Open it up and ask God to give you a specific word for your situation that you're in right now. 
and you you get that, you highlight it, you put it up, you pray over it, you talk about it, you think about it, you bank on it, and you live on that word. All right, so let's look at the prophetic word in our lectionary reading today. Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, talks about the branch of the Lord, and here's what it says. In that day... <clears throat> The branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And he who is left in Zion and remains in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Everyone who has been recorded for life in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and cleansed the bloodstains of Jerusalem from its midst by the spirit of judgment and by a spirit of burning, then the Lord will create over the whole site of Mount Zion and over her assemblies a cloud by day and a smoke and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy. There will be a booth for shade by day from the heat and for a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. This is a prophetic statement where God is saying to Israel, look, when the exile's over, when you're restored, the branch of the Lord will be glorious. You know what the branch is? The branch in the Old Testament, when it talks about the branch, it says it several times in the prophets. It's talking about Messiah, Jesus. The branch of the Lord, the Lord's the branch, that extended branch of God that comes and rules over the earth. It says it'll be more beautiful and glorious. When God has washed away the filth by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. Now, here's the thing I want to focus on in this prophetic statement is that what God's saying to Israel is, look, when I'm through burning away the garbage, when I'm through burning away the sin, burning away the idolatry of Israel, burning away the compromise and the injustice and the unrighteousness, when I'm, getting, when I'm done burning all that away through the exile, then you're going to be able to see the righteous branch. You're going to see the Messiah. You couldn't even see him if he was standing in front of you right now because you're so surrounded by idols. You, if Jesus walked down Main Street, Jerusalem, you wouldn't recognize him. You, I've got to burn away some junk. There are times I, I, I have about two and a half acres at my house, and I sometimes I have to burn away a bunch of uh, excess weeds and garbage in order to get to the real trees that are in there or, or the bigger branches. And, and I've got to burn away the stuff that's getting in the way. I really believe that we have been in a time of, of a spirit of judgment and burning. And I don't mean that in a punitive way. I mean that in a corrective way, that God has literally been burning away things that we have taken for granted. God has been burning away the idolatry in his church. He's been burning away the materialism. He's been burning away the compromise. He's been burning away the division. He's been burning away all these things. And the reason is, just like it was in Isaiah chapter 4, so that he could reveal the righteous branch again. I believe that one of the great things that's happening in the church today, in the middle of all of our strife, in the middle of all of our searching, in the middle of all of our having to shift around, is that many, many believers are getting a fresh picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. That many believers are rediscovering Jesus Christ. There are people who have grown up in church and their version of Jesus has been a very worldly, very nationalistic, very uh, cultural uh, Jesus that has nothing to do with the Jesus of the New Testament. And people are, are peeling back all of that fake stuff. And they're peeling back all that stuff and looking at what does the Bible say about Jesus himself? Who is Jesus? And I believe a lot of people, maybe you, have gotten a fresher, clearer picture of Jesus Christ recently than you ever had before. Maybe you're praying in ways you never prayed before. Maybe you're looking at the scripture in ways you never read it before. Maybe this time of being locked down has helped you to really discover your king. Yes, some people have walked away. That's sad, isn't it? Some people have said, well, Jesus didn't do what I wanted him to do. Um, I've literally seen people walk away from the church because of the, they didn't get what they wanted in the election. Are you serious? Then, then that's just a real case of idolatry right there, friend. If you forsook Jesus because the election didn't go the way you wanted, but can I just be blunt? You weren't worshiping Jesus in the first place. 
Listen, Jesus is revealing who he is. And sometimes what happens is people get disillusioned and people walk off. And there have been people who've left the church because it's not what they wanted it to be. They thought it was this big, big, big money cultural party where they could just keep living their old lifestyle and, and, and still say they're following Jesus. When they found out they couldn't do that, they, they hit the back door, right? And that happens, guys. But, you know, that's all part of God renewing his church because now he's showing who Jesus really is. And people are saying, look, do you either want to follow him or you don't? And then what happens is there's this promise in, in Isaiah chapter 4 that he will be a refuge. He's going to be the fire by night and the cloud by day. Remember in Israel when God led them through the wilderness by the cloud by day and the fire by night? Jesus becomes that fire cloud in the day, that fire by night that leads you through the wilderness. He becomes that booth of refuge, that shade from the heat, the shelter from the storm that, that Isaiah refers to here. Jesus is all of those things. And I want to, I wonder how many of you have discovered him in that way. How many of you are standing underneath the refuge today? How many of you are at a place where Jesus Christ is more important to you now than he ever was? that he's more vital to you, more beautiful to you, more powerful to you than he ever was. You see, this is revival. This is what God does. God's grace is greater than the things happening around us and the things happening within us, right? Because no, he exposes our weaknesses. He gets rid of the filth. He burns it away, and he reveals who he is, and he changes us. His grace is bigger than the things that are happening in Washington. His grace is bigger than the things happening all over the country. His grace is greater than, than the economy. His grace is greater than politics. His grace is greater than COVID-19. His grace is greater than all those things, and, and people are discovering that. And so I really believe that, that God is, is re revealing himself through a spirit of burning and judgment. And it's, he's burning away junk. So I would say to you, Lord, uh, I would say that you should say to the Lord, Lord, burn away everything that's not of you in my life. If it's not you, I don't want it. Burn it away. Where's the compromise? Where are the places where I've gone to sleep spiritually? Where are the places where I've allowed sin to take root in my life and told myself that Jesus was okay with it? Where's, where have I become more interested in who I am as an American or a conservative or a liberal or a white or a black or a male or a female than who I am in Jesus Christ? Where have I become so wrapped up in those idols of the culture that I, don't, I no longer focus on him? Or I may be trying to get Jesus to be like me. I'm trying to say, Jesus, now, you're really like this, aren't you? You're really a conservative, aren't you, Jesus? No, Jesus, no, you're really a liberal, aren't you, Jesus? No, Jesus, you'd probably be a Democrat, wouldn't you? Jesus, you'd probably be a Republican, wouldn't you? Jesus, would you own a gun? Come on, Jesus. And so it's all about that. We're trying to get Jesus to be like us, and we need to be changing to be like him. This is the deal. And so God's revealing the beauty of the righteous branch. He's showing people who Jesus really is and burning away the garbage. And oh, I just say, Lord, please burn away. Burn away the stupidity of my idolatry. Burn away the compromise. Burn away all of my junk. And Lord, help me to walk with you. Now, the next thing as we get to the power, you know, God gives his grace is greater than the problems between us. There's a story in Acts chapter 11 where, uh, well, let me just read it to you. Let me give you the context. In chapter 10, Simon Peter, good old Jewish apostle, is out preaching the gospel. And God leads him through a series of, of, of coordinated kind of events to a man named Cornelius who is a Gentile. He is a Roman centurion. And this Gentile is a God-fearing man, but he doesn't know Jesus. And so by, by providence, God leads Peter to Cornelius. Cornelius and his whole household get saved. In fact, it says while Peter's preaching, the Holy Spirit comes down on them just like he did at Pentecost on those Jews. This is the first time that non-Jewish people are experiencing the forgiveness and power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel has crossed the barrier into the Gentiles. Well, if you, if you don't know this, that during that period, that was one of the big controversies, that there were Jewish Christians who thought there's no way you can be a Christian unless you're a Jew. 
There's no way you can be a Christian unless you're a Jew first. This gospel is just for the Jews, right? Well, Peter kind of thought that too for a while, but he's starting to discover something. He makes a big discovery because when he sees the Holy Spirit come down on those Gentiles, just like he did at Pentecost, it blows his mind. Well, in chapter 11, he reports on that story. Let me read it to you. It says, now the apostles and the brothers who were brought throughout, who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party, that's the Jews who think he can't be saved unless you're a Jew, criticized him, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. How dare you do that? That's not nice. But Peter again explained, began to explain it to them in order. Here's what he said. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. Something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice say to me, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, by no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, what God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up into again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were, sent to me from Caesarea. Spirit told me to go with them. Making no distinction, these six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who's called Peter, and he will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, listen to this, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 17 is the kicker here. Peter sums up his story with this. If then God gave the same gift to them, as he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way? Well, when they heard these things, they fell silent. And they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This was a great time of discovery for the church. You mean Jesus is saving Gentiles too? Aren't you and I, most of us who are Gentiles, aren't we glad for that discovery? Verse 17, let me read it again because this is what I'm going to preach on. Listen, if God gave them the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to stand in God's way? And as I read that this morning, that stood out to me above everything else. You know what Peter was saying? Peter was saying, look, if those people over there got the same Holy Spirit that I've got, who am I to stand in God's way? Friend, that's a really important word today. If God gave those Gentiles the same Holy Spirit that he gave the Jews, who am I to, to push them out, right? Now, what does that have to do with you and me? Well, I think that, there's, that we, here's, here's the main idea. You and I need to learn to honor the Holy Spirit in the lives of people who aren't like us. You see, Peter learned that you don't have to be a Jew to have the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who makes us one. So G Peter's saying, look, I'm a Jew and I've got the Holy Spirit. You're a Gentile, you've got the Holy Spirit. So if I, if I push you out, if I reject you, then I'm rejecting the Holy Spirit, right? And so where, how does that apply to us today? I think you can figure this out. I don't think you need much explanation with this. But there are, there, we're in a spirit of division in our culture today, in our church today that there are many of us who are spending more time trying to find the Antichrist than trying to find Christ. There are many of us who are looking with suspicion on fellow brothers and sisters because they don't align with us politically. Or maybe they're not in the same denomination. Or maybe they don't have the same exact theological views as we do. Or maybe they have a little bit different take on politics than we do. And so what we're saying is, well, the, that person has to be a heretic because they disagree with me. I've never seen more people accused of being heretics in my entire life. Why? Because there's one area of disagreement that we have. Oh, well, you're clearly a heretic. You're clearly not of God. 
And we, we've got this defensive Christianity going on where we're, where we're holding our brothers and sisters at arm's distance because, well, you don't think like me. You don't have the same opinions I have. You don't vote like me. You don't act like me. Therefore, you're probably not as Christian as I am. Let me enlighten you as I'm enlightening myself. There's not a junior Holy Spirit for those other people. There's the same Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit came down on that person, if that person repented of their sins and the Spirit of God came upon them and they are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, then who are you to stand in God's way and say, oh, they're not a real Christian because they don't read the same version of the Bible that I read? Oh, they're not a Christian because they have a different way of doing church than I do. Oh, they're not a real Christian because they don't, uh, they don't uh, have the same uh, social uh, practices that I have. Now, I realize that we need to be distinguished between truth and error. I, I get that. And I believe that we do need to be discerning. And, and there are people who are claiming to be Christians who are not Christians. And I get that. The Bible says by their fruit you will know them. It doesn't say by their opinions you will know them. It doesn't say by their culture you will know them. It says by their fruit. Now, where is the fruit? The fruit of the Holy Spirit. Do you see love, joy, peace, patience, those kind of the fruit of the Spirit? Now, friends, I've got Christian friends who are way more liberal than I am. And I've got Christian friends who are way more conservative than I am. But I see the love and the faith and the hope that is in them that is exactly the same as mine. And I wish they'd think more like me. Let's just be honest. I wish they'd act more like me. I wish they'd just take all my opinions at face value and just agree with everything I say. I wish they'd look at government the way I do and, and look at society the way I do, but they don't. They don't. But I need to understand that those are my brothers and sisters in Christ because they have the Spirit, because it's the Holy Spirit that identifies us as children of God. Have they repented of their sins? Have they believed in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they trust him as Lord and Savior and King? I've got Christian friends who didn't vote the way I voted. I've got Christian friends who don't think about social issues the way I think about them. But they will stand with me in glory. Because their faith is not, our, we're not saved by our opinions. We're saved by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the thing that I feel like the Spirit of God was saying to me, is that we're, we've got to stop pushing apart as Christians and start pulling together. I've got to say to my, my brothers and sisters uh, who are serving Christ in different ways, I've got to say to them, um, you're, I may not agree with everything you're saying. I may not agree with everything you're doing, but I'm going to tell you this. As long as you're serving him, as long as you're going after him and believing on him, you're my brother, you're my sister. We're partners in the gospel. Now we can sharpen each other. We can correct each other. We can disagree with each other and we might need to do that. There might be times I need to say, hey, I think you're way off base here. That's fine but I don't need to be divisive about it. You see, I can, I can try to correct you, you can try to correct me, and we can still love one another because the grace of God is larger. Listen to this. The grace of God is larger than those things that come between us. And if my gospel only allows people like me to go to heaven, then it's not much of a gospel. You know when you stand in glory, you're going to be standing next to people who were not of your race, who were not your gender, who may or may not have even voted or even voted at all, who may or may not think like you, who be a different generation from you. Maybe they were different in social class than you, but they believed on the Lord Jesus and he, his spirit came on them. Can I honor the Holy Spirit in people who aren't like me? There's the deal. You know, let, let God handle, you know, in Romans chapter 14, it says, um, who am I to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he rises or falls and God is able to make him stand. You know, I'm going to tell you, God rebuked me the other day in prayer. You know, you know, the spirit's talking to you when he disagrees with you. And I was praying for a particular person that I have felt critical feelings toward a fellow believer. And I was asking God to change that person. And I felt in my spirit 
the Lord saying, why are you telling me how to, how to lead my people? You know, it's one thing for me to pray for somebody to grow. It's one thing for me to pray for somebody to become more holy as, as I'm praying for me to become more holy. But when I start telling God how other people ought to be, Lord, I wish you'd make that person more like this. I wish you'd make that person more like that. Then I start getting into territory that's not my own territory. And he really got after me. I, I had to ask for forgiveness. I had to say, God, I'm sorry for telling you how to raise your kids. I mean, I wouldn't want people telling me how to raise my children. So don't tell God how to raise his kids. You pray for the spirit on them. You pray for God to sanctify them. You pray for God to make them more and more like Jesus and, and to make you more and more like Jesus in the process. If there is sin, pray for God to reveal that to them and pray for those things. But don't, don't try to, don't, don't become so focused on, on your version of Christianity that you think nobody else can go to heaven unless they're like you. And so this is the thing what Peter said. He said, look, if he gave them the same spirit he gave me, who am I to stand in his way? And every time I try to hinder people from what they're doing, it reminds me of the story of John. In John's gospel, early in John's career as a disciple, you can tell he hadn't matured much when he said this. He said to Jesus, Jesus, we saw a man trying to cast out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him. And I'm sure John thought Jesus was going to say, well, I'll go stop him. Jesus said, "Don't said, leave him alone. Nobody doing a miracle in my name will afterwards be able to speak lightly about me. You see, whoever John was trying to stop was doing what John was supposed to already be doing. And sometimes, you know, when people don't follow my group, it's easy for me to think, well, I don't really know. And, and here in our culture, guys, when I look on the internet and I hear the way Christians talk to each other, we are so eager to find heretics when we ought to be looking for allies and partners in the gospel. Now, there are heretics. I get that. But some of us are so obsessed with finding the bad in everybody. We're so busy looking for the devil in our brothers and sisters that we're missing the very presence of Christ in somebody right next to us. You know, we need to learn that, that, uh, that God has called us to be partners together in the gospel. So I want to challenge you today to remember this thing. Number one, God's grace is greater than anything going on inside of me. My own issues and my own weaknesses, his grace is greater. Isn't that great news? God's grace is greater than anything going on around me. No matter what people do or things happen or situations change, his grace is bigger and greater than all of those things. And God's grace is greater than anything that comes between me and you. That you and I can disagree, you and I can be different, you and I are different parts of the same body and we're functioning in different ways and, and you might be more focused on one thing than I am and I'm focused over here on something else. We don't need to convert each other, we just need to, to pray for each other because we're all doing what the kingdom calls us to do. And so if uh, so, don't, don't try to get people to be as conservative as you are. Don't try to get them to be as liberal as you are. Don't try to get them to, to give up their ministry and take up your ministry. Uh, we're all part of it. And God's doing so many great things on so many different levels. Everything from evangelism to social justice to, to healing to, to uh, charity to compassion ministry to all these. And God's calling people to do different things, standing up for truth, apologetics, defending the faith. So many different levels that God's calling people to work on. And we need to honor what he's doing in everybody instead of saying, well, if you're not doing what I'm doing, you're probably not of God. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. And let's widen the road. Let's give him great grace uh, without compromising with the world. Now, I get that. We don't want to compromise with sin or evil. I'm not talking about compromising with sin or evil. I'm talking about letting somebody who's a genuine believer in Jesus have the dignity and, and, and respect of, of being a child of God without you having to uh, beat them up because they're not like you. So let, let's, let's just have more grace toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. And let's walk together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come. Thankful for who you are and all that you've done. Lord, forgive us when, we're, when we limit your grace. When we try to say that your grace is only possible when it comes the way it came for us. Lord, it all comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's without you, we have no hope. 
that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by you. But Lord, there are so many different ways that people meet you. As Lord, as we repent of our sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, we have eternal life. I pray your blessing on every brother and sister out there that's doing your work and seeking your kingdom. Even if we disagree on how it's to be done, may we strive together as partners in the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today. Go in peace.